You're listening to No Hipsters Pod. Episode 32, No Hipsters Pod. It's your boy, Ronte, the founder of NoHipstersAlot.com. And this week, we have music, entertainment, radio veteran, Paul Porter. Hey, Paul, what's man. up? How are you? How are you? I'm ready. I'm ready to roll. You ready? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much for doing this. I, I was wondering what you were going to call me, man. I thought you might have said I was from America's Most Wanted because I've done so much gangster stuff in my career, but uh, 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 you know, we'll, we'll get you know. Actually, well, let's start with that. So, um, I, I've been reading your book, Blackout, which is uh, it's a good. I'm not I'm not all the way through yet, but good read. And actually, one of the stories, one of the anecdotes that jumps out at me is the incident with Master P. So, um, for anyone listening, so you know, Paul Porter is uh, a veteran in radio. So, over what I want to say, 45 years at this point. Yeah, radio and television, man. Radio and television. See, most people know the BET side, not the radio. But, yeah, but anyway, I, I've got to do a lot of things over the past 43 years. Started out in the 70s at a college radio station in Boston that, you know, Boston didn't have an FM station, black, and college radio was big. That college radio station, and I flipped at Northeastern University from a you know, 98% white campus turned the radio station all black and great people oh, have nice. come out of there since then. Wendy Williams, a guy named Mike Shannon, oh. who does Sirius XM, Jay Dixon's the program director, Kiss, Darius Walker, CNN bureau chief, and all these were in a radio station in college. But it shows what happens when... uh you bond together and get it early. So, you know, after after Boston, I got hired in D.C. at Kiss with Donnie Simpson, which was an NBC wow. station. And I was I was the young gun there. And, you know, I went from ten thousand dollars a year in 82 to sixty five thousand, got a television show which led to, you know, voiceovers for the NBC station. Then it led to BET, which led to more radio, which led to more television, which led to, you know, activism and awareness. And, it, you know, it, it led to the need to have ownership because I, I bounced around a lot. You know, I had a lot of great jobs. But sometimes if you're not at the table, you'll be on the menu. And that's one thing I learned. And now I own my own station in Orlando, The Wire. Nice, uh, nice, nice. It's a nonprofit. But, yeah, so it, it, it's been a long journey that uh, brings me to your next question. Right. So it's funny. As you were saying, new questions came up. So before I even ask about, like, the whole Master Fee incident, where you met, so your time at Northeastern is where you met Wendy Williams? Yes, yeah, she came up under me at the radio station. And oh. I, I was the first person to leave and get a commercial job. See, when you're in college, you're doing it not knowing really how good you are. And until somebody leaves and gets that big job, everybody else didn't have the confidence. And luckily, I was the first one to leave and got a great job. And so everybody at the station looked up to me and I was sort of the one, the connector of the dots. But, oh, I forgot the Master P story. So I'm a BET and things, you know, I was there for a while. I became program director. But, you know, I've always been sort of like a fighter. Like I grew up in a different era, you know, growing up in the 60s in Queens. You know, that was the civil rights era where music was powerful. And, um, you know, it was just a different attitude about taking control of situations. And in, in New York, I grew up, my best friend, father, mother split up, and he remarried Nina Simone. A, oh, wow. A guy named Andy Stroud. So I used to spend weekends at Nina Simone's house, seeing her sing on the piano, not knowing that she was a superstar. You know, I was too young to gravitate, but Mr. Stroud took me under his wing and got to see record labels and how action, sometimes you got to be tough because he was a tough guy. And 
that brings me to Master P. So I'm, I go back to program BET and we're competing against MTV. And a lot of black artists all started at BET. MTV didn't pick them up till later. Shit. MTV didn't play Michael Jackson. That was the first black artist. And that's in the eighties. Right. So, you know, this racism thing is real. So P was, I, I forgot if it was the MTV awards or something, out in L.A., Master P, who was hot, that BET, you know, he started signing acts. And there was the MTV Awards, and he blew off our interview. He said, you know, the well, he set up something, he blew it off. I pulled off all of his videos. Oh, wow. You know, from his groups, his video. And the label, the label call being the head of the label and said, you can't do this to P, P. Uh, and I'm like, yes, I can. You, we started this. And so <laughs> the funny part of the story is I get a call and this is right before cell phones. I, I remember I got my first cell phone that year. That was like normal. I used to have all those big cell phones, but people right. called the office then. And I get a call, and I, I hear somebody say, this is P, this is P. And I'm like, yo, my name is Paul. And I wasn't thinking it was Master P. I just hear this New Orleans accent that I can't understand. And I'm like, nah, this is P. What do you want? <laughs> yo, uh, I want you to play my video. Yeah, I'll play your damn video. Who's this? This is P. And he never said Master P, and I never got it. And I hung up, and two days later, I get a call from security, Master P's on the campus. And that that's back when everybody was getting beat up, Steve's down in offices, and hip-hop was real bold and making money, and everybody was asking. Wait, wait, Steve Stout beat someone up? No, Steve Stout got beat up. Oh. Yeah, by Diddy wow. and the Universal New York, yeah. But wow. but uh when you get through the book you'll 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 hear more stories like that. Right, right. That really don't get shared. So anyway, BET's a pretty big campus. So I had about seven, eight minutes for them to get across to come see me. And he, he that's when Master P was rep he started the sports agency too. So he had wrestlers and that's when he was playing basketball. So anyway, I said, you know, my my assistant Tuma, as a matter of fact, Tuma now and here it is twenty years later, he's the head of uh, YouTube uh, Global. And Tuma went on; he left BT to MTV. He started Spotify's Rap Caviar. Uh, he was at Revolt before that, and then left the YouTube. But that that's that's how long I've been growing. Now he's you know twenty years deep in the game, and I mentored him. But that's how it happened. So Tuma's all worried about that's, you're, you're referring, uh, Tuma Tuma Bassa, I believe. Yeah, Tuma Bassa. Uh huh. Got gotcha. So he's <laughs> he's all worried about me, and I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, let let him in, let him in. And I got a real small office at the time, and. They come in and uh, Master P and Boz and like, yo, what's the deal? And I said, yo, man, I've been waiting for you. And I pull open my drawer and I had a Smith & Wesson 6906 bright silver black gun. I pull it out the drawer. I look at P and Boz and say, I hope there's not going to be any trouble. <laughs> and they smile. And P goes, man, I like this motherfucking Boz. What's <laughs> up? What's up? And I said, man, y'all know what's up, man. You didn't show up on me. I got a new job, and you gonna try to make me lose the job. I'm, I'm put going up in ratings because my job was to come in before the sale to a Viacom. Right. So I had changed everything. BT used to play 1,500 videos. I made it 200, and I record companies were pissed and artists were pissed. So I didn't mind losing Master P. They had other stars. I had TLC. I had Destiny's Child. You know, so... Wait, question, that, quick question. I'm sorry to interrupt. So what's the strategy there? Playing fewer videos? Yeah, playing better videos. And guess what? The ratings doubled. <laughs> they We were playing so much trash. Like... 
the top videos back on the BT playlist would play seven times a week, you know, once each day. I was playing videos once every four hours. You know, I just made it a rotation. I brought what we gotcha. were doing in radio to video. And that's how MTV was. You you would just see the top hits. Right. But right. this way, you know, when we broke something, we were really on it and it was ours. And I thought that reason the same reason why Master P left us, because we really didn't support him that much, but it was always the stepping stone, and I wanted to make it the top dog. You know, no, at, at MTV, you're going to get one spin, and, you know, at BET, you'll get 23 spins, but you can't do that until you sort out the minutia. Right. You know, programming's always the same. Just like, you know, social media, we talk about content. That's all this life is about content. Who can condense the best words in a break to be a comedian? Who can deliver the most dramatic line? I, I mean, so, this is about performance. Right. So so I get it. So it's basically making BT's airtime more exclusive. Yeah. And so I get that. And now the other side of that is that it it allows for less variety and so do you feel like that might be an unintended consequence well, of that? I, I think what happens now, I, hearing, hearing something every four hours is different to what happens today. Now you hear it every 60 to 70 minutes of top five. Right. So, so that really affects the balance. Basically BET was oversaturated. You know, they didn't even have a top 40 because they couldn't play 40 videos in a week. You know, so so that's why I shortened it. And when you look at it in a bigger picture, you know, it makes sense. It makes it makes it cuts the weeds out. But right. record companies used to spend so much money on music videos. There was no YouTube then, you right. know, so. It was important. That was their commercial. And now, you know, you can post on your own and the MTVs and BETs are not known for videos anymore. That, you Which know, is unfortunate. Yeah. It took that, you know, an artist want to be on BET jams, but it doesn't mean that much. Right, right, right. And so wait, was, was Stephen Hill at BET during that time? No, he was at MTV, gotcha. and that's when he came over then, yeah. Okay. So that all happens with Master P. That gets sorted out. And so after BET, you go back to radio, I believe. Yep. So in the first no, chapter— matter of fact, I, 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 I was always in radio, but I went to start Quincy Jones Cable Network, which was called New TV. And the problem that so many people of color face is the same problem Quincy Jones. I think we were running about 10 months, had programming up, but we couldn't get any cable households. They had a block, you know, uh, Comcast had bought BET, and that guaranteed them the expansion from 66 million homes to 100. And they all the carriers wouldn't take another black channel. They only took up until this day, you know, they got one and kind of some others, you know, as, even though the landscape has, you know, massively expanded, there's not a lot of black ownership. Right. And the thing is that even a lot of the white owned stations, I mean, the quote unquote black stations are owned by white people, number one. <laughs> yeah. But, but like stations that don't market as black, yeah. I feel like actually have a lot of black content. I think, like, you know, look at VH1, for instance, you have Love and Hip Hop yeah. and all these other shows that really, you know, are centered around black characters and in many ways, uh, are focused on black audiences. So it's, it's really interesting what, uh, yeah, but over TV. history, they do it all the time. You know, Fox that started out black, all their sitcoms were Martin and, and living color and 
uh, so many blacks and, and UPN did the same thing. It's always we consume black and brown people consume so much, you know, and when we see us, we go. And, and that's how that's how it keeps happening. You know, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors in this game. Yeah, it's quite interesting. And so let's go to, I guess, the first big story in your book. And trust me, I, I, we definitely have to have another conversation because I'm sure there's so many other things uh, to talk about. But this one, and the, the, which opens the book, is um, the story about you taking Rod Digga's song off the radio. So uh, a, a, her hit from 2003, uh, you know, Party and Bullshit, was popular on the radio and it has a line that goes, I'll beat that bitch with a bat. Yeah. Which by the way was my favorite line. And so <laughs> you meet a, a young girl and she says that people are making fun of her because, um, that apparently her, her father, her mom was actually murdered by her father. You know, not murdered was beat up by the father with a bat. Up, with I a was bat. volunteering at a school in Queens. I was back in New York doing radio and voiceovers. Right. And Latia came up to me, and there was this program where I was teaching kids to be broadcast with a note crying, Mr. Paul, can you get this song off the radio? And when a you know, young kid looks at you and you go, what's wrong? And she writes a note and says, dear Mr. Paul, can you get this song by Raw Digger off the radio? The kids are making fun of me every day because my mom's mm-hmm. in Roosevelt Hospital. My father beat, beat her almost to death with a bat. And that hit me, you know, and I knew how wild the music was getting. And that started my my change to sort of be it was like an epiphany for me. And some extra lights went on that I can either be a part of this or try, you know, because there were days where we day parted songs, or played edited versions and, you know, there was more balance, too. You know, in the 90s, right. there were actually black love songs that top the charts, you know. What a time, right? <laughs> <laughs> what a time. <laughs> and so it's funny. So my thing, so I, I, after reading that story, I actually had mixed feelings about it. Because in some way, I feel like Rod Digga, I uh, suffered because of that, as well-meaning as your decision was. Um, so you emailed like, you know, the, the suits at MS communications, which owned, uh, or owns hot 97 and the song is, uh, taken off during the daytime, I believe. Yeah. And so now this is a song that is getting less spins because of essentially your decision. Yeah. And so, and that, that song is pretty much, you know, Rod Digger's biggest hit. Right. And so who knows how much bigger that hit could have been and who knows what else might have happened in her career if she if that song was bigger and so do you feel like you might have uh impacted her career unfairly like do you do you have any do you have any do you second guess that decision oh hell no not a doubt in my mind i think it's so much more important to not reprogram our culture and our kids ever than one radio station and one artist Uh, and i think there should be more you know there's certain things that, you know, the crazy thing is these super big companies that spend hundreds of millions of dollars promoting stuff, the balance, that's all I'm saying. That's not our only story. Gangsters, bullshit, misogyny, and bling is not the black story. Black music culturally lifted us up for a long time. So I've been around long enough to see the changes. Like my favorite joint growing up as a kid was James Brown, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. I heard that record when I was 11. And back then we were Negro and colored. And (laughs) I was finally, we were scared to be called Black. And when James Brown said it, the whole country was Black. So that's the power in music. So, no, I don't feel bad about that either. I I think those records can happen. They just don't have to be played in in commercial places that are licensed that have rules. Like, don't break the rules for my people all the time. 
Yeah, so have you actually run into or heard from Rodriguez since Man, making the I've, story public? I've heard from the labels, and I've taken on other artists. Yeah, I hear, and some people are upset, and th- that's cool, you know. I I took on Rihanna on Entertainment Tonight, and, oh. and that was like the worst experience of all time. That's when I my Twitter was trolled. I, was, I had murder and death threats because Rihanna's video got yanked. But that's cool, man. That's part of the heat. Like, wait, which of the which of the videos did you, did you get yanked? Ah, uh, I forgot the name of it. If you look up Paul Porter Entertainment tonight, was uh, it wait Rush, Russian Roulette? Yeah, Russian Roulette. That was. Uh, it. I had a feeling. As a matter of uh. fact, I have a website, raprehab.com. It's still up, and that initial story's on there because it broke off the website. Right. You know, and I. I just thought it was, it, it was like, really? Now we're doing videos and we ended by shooting people in the head? Like, that's what I mean. It, it's, it's, it's a little too much all the time. And I just thought Rihanna's image. So, yeah, sometimes somebody's got to take heat, you know, but my heat comes from seeing massive changes, you know, and I fight about, it's just not music. It's like, why are black formats the number one syndication format on the planet where they put, you know, the breakfast club in 200 markets and don't have local news and local issues anywhere else. And there's only one black station in a lot of these cities. Like, come on, you know, it's sometimes you got to look a little deeper into how the games play and how we, we are kept away from decision-making you know, positions. We're always great as presidents of labels under somebody else, but not too many real leaders are still from this. Yeah, but but are you are you blaming that on the music or are you blaming that on like just racism at large? Oh, racism at large. Okay. You know, if you're not at the table, you're gonna be on the menu. Like okay. there there's no, you know, hip hop can you imagine if hip hop did a stop the violence record now? Like stop the violence was a huge thing for hip hop, you know, and they brought some attention. Could that happen now with little baby, the baby and 21 Savage? Who's, <laughs> who's lying. I shoot, a, I shoot niggas a lot, <laughs> you know, it's yeah, right. And right. I love that joint, <laughs> but I'm just saying, <laughs> That, right. That, so that, 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 yeah. yeah. So that's the thing. And I love that you admit that you that you love it, right? Because you know, like me, I mean, I would never hit anyone with a bat or would want anyone to do that. But that that line was kind of catchy, right? In the Rod Digger song. And so, do you feel like you are kind of stifling art in any way? No, I'm just trying to stop it from being on in public licensed venues that come under FCC. Do whatever you want at home with your kids, but just don't program it to my kids. You know, look, these large companies, if you can't do it at work, why are you doing it everywhere else? Okay? That's all I'm saying. Like, there's company guidelines, and then there's the products that they put out. And when the products they put out, won't work in their workplace, then I got a question sometime. Are these your values or is it okay for, you know, brothers and sisters to call them bitches and hoes in the office? So right, right, right. That, that's all I'm saying. Hmm. And have you been, because I know this is big this, these days on the internet, have you been accused? Of, or I guess the question is, how many times have you been accused of uh, playing respectability politics? I really haven't. You, oh, okay. You know, <laughs> I, I, you know, I've been called things, but you know, I, I, I think, I think it, it's really. I've been on Capitol Hill. I've been different places, and yeah, I hear some rumblings, but nobody wants to go into a challenge about this subject. Like that's the issue. Like, could I get Jimmy Iovine to do a panel on it? Or can you get, all you can get is rappers. Nobody ever gets executives to talk about, 
You know, nobody talks to Monty Lippman at Universal because they don't talk about issues that deal with black folks in the community. And I'm not saying they don't support it, but they're not challenged. And until they're challenged, nothing's going to change. Okay. And do you feel like you are maybe placing too much responsibility on the artist and less on parents? Oh, I'm not. I'm not. No, I'm not putting it on the artists. I'm putting it on companies Companies, to keep balance and standards. And yes, I think parents are extra important. But unfortunately, a lot of black and brown parents work 24-7. And the difference of mobile phones is uh, is kids are growing up on their phones and, and good parents and bad parents. And I'm not saying you have to be in a broken home to be reprogrammed either. I think it's affecting all of us. You know, it affects how white people think of black people. You know, that's where the stereotypes begin. You know, on the news, if it bleeds, it leads. If you see a black person in the first 15 minutes in the news, it's normally a murder or a shooting or some incident. It's not, you know... It was happening during Black History Month. Gotcha. Okay. And so, actually, I could talk about this forever because I, I think there's so many, so many questions come to mind. Because I, so a part of me wonders if maybe there is a generational divide at play. And actually, you know, as someone in the book actually accuses you of that. And so, do you feel like maybe you just weren't? You just were from a different time, and so maybe your sensibilities were different? No, I, because- I, I, I think, you know, it's easy to play the numbers card. You know, you're too old and don't get it. But right. it's quite obvious that I do get it because I still win playing hip-hop and R&B. But I get it because I know how the systems run and people with certain messages don't even get pushed. They don't get in the system. And, you know, I talk about how and why it happens in my book, Blackout. I talk about it all my life. So this experience that I'm sharing with people, it's hard to grasp at, at first, but culturally, all I know is that there should be balance. We did a study, it's almost uh, 10, 15 years now. It's called the Rap on Rap, and it was a study of MTV and BET videos during, during a period over, I think it was 60 days. And like 85% of the videos were all about misogyny, violence, bling, drugs, and sex, that that was it. You know, 85%. And that's not our story. It's never been. Right. And so how much of this is a result of just the taste of younger music fans? And, or, you know, how much of it is just but the decision what, makers? That's my thing. The industry control the taste. They gotcha. program the taste to us. You know, right. they put it in all these powerful situations And now they're in the algorithms on Spotify with the top list that are still owned by the powers that be. You know, people think this is some free music world. If it was free, there'd be an independent artist that puts out a record and never goes to a major record label and everybody plays it and they get really rich all by themselves. But they don't. You know, in 2019, the industry made $11.8 billion, and the artists only got 12% of that money. So so when when you start studying the numbers and the system, it's a ripoff. So who controls the culture? The artists? No. (laughs) It's the people that decide to sign the artists and what direction they're going to go to. And and most of most Americans are sheep. You know, I say 85 percent of them do what they they hear and think. It's even though we can sort out all these different Internet radio stations. When you look at the Mm. top of the charts, they're all on the major labels. True. True. With a very rare exception every now and then. Yeah, very rare. (laughs) 
So um, that's interesting. So speaking of labels and how they control what we hear, let's talk payola. So in the intro of your book, you talk about being in D.C., funny enough, uh, and uh, you are at a hotel and someone hand delivers a package uh, that has $30,000 in it. And it's from a, an alias Karen Klein. FedEx. No return FedEx, address. My brother. FedEx. At one FedEx. Four, FedEx. Yeah, was, Hotel George, right in, right in the Union Square or whatever it is downtown next to the train station. Right. What? So, yeah, I get a FedEx, and nobody told me I was getting a FedEx. And I just see Karen Klein, a dress coming out of the South. I open it up. It's just three envelopes, no note, and money. You know, plenty of money, all $100 bills. And I'm like, oh, damn, what the hell's going right. on? And I knew it was from somebody, and I'd find out on Monday because I didn't have a cell phone. And I was in a hotel, and sure enough, I found out it was a welcome to a, a, the new job money. Oh, at, wait, what job was this? At BET. Oh, so this was right before you started at yeah. BET? Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. Interesting. And do you know who the envelope yeah, was from? Yeah, of course. It was from oh. an independent rep that was repping all the major labels. Did you ever get in trouble for... T- First of all, do the payola laws apply to television the same oh, way? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. So did you ever get in trouble for that? No. For telling the story? No. Nope. Huh. No. Look, man, I've been on panels with FCC commissioners. They are not worried about content, how it happens. The government is worried about broadband and setting license so people make money. You know, this country's based on money. It's not about, you know, really sensitivity or inclusion, even though they might say certain things. But, yeah, um, the FCC doesn't do things like that. Like, they don't penalize people for a lot of penalties that happen, you know. Some of the stuff that yeah. happens, they're terrible. You know, like you can send in a complaint, you'll get an email back and never be able to talk to anybody ever. And I've been through wow. that side of it. You know, I, I had a nonprofit that I started that year, Industry Ears. And we did a lot of stuff on Capitol Hill. And, um, okay, you know. It's it's strange trying to work politics when it comes to broadcasting. I got lucky enough to meet a few FCC commissioners to the panel, and they are quite honest. They just don't have the manpower to police anything. You know, that's their jurisdiction, you know, and and they just don't have the manpower. So that's, that's a lot of things get overlooked when it comes to broadcasting and complaints and you can file things and unless you're a big organization like the parents television council remember with janet jackson and the super oh, bowl they, they they could get action right away because they're they're connected yeah yeah now that's that's a whole other conversation but um so I know like many decades ago, people actually did go to jail for payola, but I know it's not a big deal now because between this story that you told and even like some others. So actually Cardi B is on video actually admitting to payola. And so I now know that it's clearly not something that people are as coy about for whatever reason, but um, that's, that's interesting. And so do you ever, do you regret that one incident? Regret? Why, why should I? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Maybe like <laughs> it's against no. your eth- and and I ask that because you're clearly of someone who is very uh, you know ethical and has very strong convictions about certain things. Oh, like, well, yeah, but you know, trust me, I've broken a lot of rules and made a lot of mistakes, and I talk about it candidly too. You know, right? There's a lot of ups and downs emotionally, and sometimes you don't know where the person's head's at. Sometimes it's really not about you. You're just a victim and, and you take it personally. It's funny, I was on the on the clubhouse app in a room when I first got on 
And uh, they were telling industry stories, and it was a big room, and I'm all hyped up. Tyrese is on, and somebody calls me to the stage because I didn't know what that was, and and I was going to be next. And all of a sudden, they said, Stephen Hill. Yo, and they talked to Stephen for like four or five minutes about stories, and then they go, next up, Tyrese goes, Paul Porter. And I said, wow, I got a story, you know. The last time I saw Stephen Hill, I was getting fired at BET 60 days before I got fired. Ended 11 years there, and I never saw him again. But if I saw Stephen Hill right now, I'd give him a hug in the room, like, side. And Stephen, now here's the important part of the story. Stephen's like, oh, man, that's so nice of you, man. Paul, I never told you this. When I got to BT, you were my favorite jock of all time. I used to listen to you on KYS. He said, I lo loved your, your style so bad, I called myself the Captain Stephen Hill for six years in Boston. And I just never told you that. And I was like, oh, my God, that's weird. So really, you intimidated meeting me instead of wanting to work with me, you know? So that was his issue, not mine. Like, Oh, wait, so I'm sorry. I don't, I don't know if I had to so wait. Did he have anything to do with your firing? Yeah, he fired me. That's what I oh. said, that 20 years before, he, w he came over from MTV and fired me. But wow. the punchline of the story is I held on to it for 20 years, but I let it go when we finally met and then found out it was his issue. It had nothing to do. I was doing the right thing, but he just looked at me as the boss and not himself as the boss. So that's why he never talked to me and this got rid of me. So that's not really my issue. That's his issue. He was the VP. He was my boss. I was program director. But, you know, stuff like that happens. And sometimes you don't find out answers in this business, you know, because people just make road decisions due to his insecurity. But that's cool. I'm okay with that. Well, you're a better better man than I am, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I'll let that go. But, you know, that's that's good on you. And so, um, wow, that's I, di I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Wow. And so it's funny. I actually see uh, Don Simpson on TV right now. They're playing the Martin episode where he's like, uh, you know, the guest star. Did okay. you meet? I know you I knew you worked with him in radio. Did you guys ever work together at BET? Oh, Donnie Simpson. Oh, yeah. I, I was there at the same time. Okay. I used to sit in and do video. So Donnie used to take off summers. And I used to do video soul, and I was on the network at the same time with Donnie. As a matter wow. of fact, they got rid of Donnie first because they were making changes and they wanted to go younger. And they got gotcha. rid of Donnie and Braun and Brett Walker and Rachel and, you know, sort of went the hip hop big Tigger route and Joe Clay. Ah, shit. Oh, that makes sense. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Well, man, this is, I, I have so many questions and we get, we're way over time, but this, you've had a very, very interesting career. I actually wanted to ask you about this lady, this name that keeps coming up, Kathy Hughes. She comes up in your stories and she also comes up in Wendy Williams' stories. Like who was she and why does she sound infamous? <laughs> Kathy Hughes is the biggest black radio station owner ever. Oh. She started out in D.C. with Radio 1, used to be on a little AM called WOL, and I was her first program director at one. She had two before me, but I got there to zero share, and she had mm -hmm. one station and a trailer on 4th and 8th Street in D.C., and it's turned it into a company with, you know, over 60 ra radio stations, uh, TV one, uh, the I, I, yeah, she's got a couple of television stations. She's done quite well, but she used to be treacherous back in the day. She was the wow. first, you know, I was there when she made her first million dollars. And it's different, mm. you know, because black people normally don't rise to that situation of, you know, right. multi million. And then she's this. You know, she's opened a lot of doors and 
she's also flipped with the pressure because right. she was so pro black and now she's so pro money. So, you know, yeah. money changes folks, especially look, it's the, this, the second generation of black folks making some money when you really think about it. Right. Right. You know, this game is still new, man. Yeah. <laughs> so it's interesting. So, so, I know that that whole thing after the Rod Digger situation, just to go back to that, I know that basically you were pushed out of the MS family of radio stations. And so do you ever feel like, do you have any, like, do you wish that they had turned out differently? Do you oh wish yeah. You- I was pissed, man. Okay. Yeah. I was fucking broken. Radio was my love. And all of a sudden I can only get a bullshit job because nobody would touch me you know right. but that shit's cool i i kind of expected it but i didn't expect it to hurt so hard you know but then i just turned my energy into fighting for things and starting to do the lecture circuit and, and it's not where you start it's how you finish and this yeah. game can yo there's so many people that ended after five years or had 10 great years or 15 years right. and now they're working at it is nothing wrong with working at golden corral but you know it's just different when you're a president of a record label and then can't get a job right you know and, and president of an urban division so it doesn't count as much it's just like you could be a director at BET and you can't get hired at a white station. They're like, BET, oh shit. Right. Nope. You know, so they'd rather take a kid from Princeton. And maybe yeah. the kid's better, but, you know, sometimes your experience only counts where you are, not what you do. Right. And like, so, there's so uh, many A&Rs. How many A&Rs do you know? Like, a hundred? Every kid has a record label. And right. they're A and R, right? But they haven't made a dime, right? Interesting, interesting. And so, um, do you feel like you have recovered from that? Like, is your name? Because oh, I feel yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, no. I'm, 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 I'm loved and hated. It's okay. It's all right. But I got like really good friends and great positions, like. You know, if I need something, I can call Joanne Reed and get on the news. Right. If when I can call Wendy or the head of CNN or my man Stan Ferretz, the anchor at ESPN, like I keep good relationships. But in this business, there's some BS happening. And I also right. speak up on the other side. So I'm going to pick up some hate and I'm going to pick up some. Hey, don't don't fuck with him with Paul Porter. He's a he's right. a rebel, you know. And I'm not I'm not the average black guy. You know what I mean? I'm six three with a deep voice. Right. And look like I can get with your wife, so that's intimidating. <laughs> you know, it is for some men. It, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Bob right. Johnson, like all of his vice presidents, were all five five. So when you walked into a room, you're like, oh shit. You, you felt like you got to get small because right. you can't talk loud because all of a sudden, if I talk loud, I'm intimidating. Right. That, no, know? that's true. Listen, I, I was just telling this to a friend recently, like so many things, so many unspoken things about people uh, kind of determine how people receive us. And mm-hmm. that includes like the way you look, your height, the sound of your voice. And the person didn't quite understand what I was getting at, but it sounds like you do, yeah. you know? And so that, that's really interesting. Uh, yo, it could be your name now. Right, right, right. You know? And, oh, trust me, as, as someone with uh, a quote-unquote ethnic name, trust me, I, I totally, totally get that. And so um, that's really interesting. So actually, before we leave it, first of all, I, I just want to say that you have a standing invitation to come back because I have a million more questions. But Yeah, we got to do a part two, man. We didn't even get into the meat and potatoes like the craziest party. Oh, right, right, right. So and I, Can I, I just I, tell I, a crazy party story? Actually, go for it. Go for it. All right. I'll make it quick. I like to share stories. So I've been to all different types of parties all over the world, like the 80s. 
in late seventies, early nineties, record companies were going crazy. So Diana Ross had a number one record. It must have been eighty three or eighty two or eighty four, something like that. Muscles. So they had written, written by Michael Jackson. Yeah. yeah, Muscles by Michael Jackson. So they were doing the big party at this hotel, the Vista Hotel, the same hotel Mary and Barry got busted for cracking. <laughs> they had the whole top floor. You know, you got off the elevators. They had hot tubs and some suites, all this stuff. But it was a toga party. And mm. back then, only white boys were wearing togas. So a toga party meant you got there and there was security at the door. You had to take off your clothes and put on a damn towel. You know, it was a toga. It was basically a robe and wrap it around you. Right. And then go over to the drug table, the liquor table, the food table, the the prostitute room. The, it was like the craziest party of all time. Me and my buddy came out the next morning at 7 o'clock, and we both looked at each other and said, what the hell happened? But I'd never seen a party with, you know, and they had all the models, and, oh, my God, it was just crazy. But it was a great party. That's all I can say. Nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, actually, you know what? Before you leave, I was going to ask this. I actually want to ask this one question. Do you have any tips for someone, uh, say, a 30 something podcast host who is looking to break into broadcast media? <laughs> Build the audience. You know, gotcha. the wonders of now is that you can build your platform by mixing it up, bringing people, but see if you can own your platform too, because. The problem is we always build things for everybody. And now, especially when it comes to talk, if you're good, like, you know, if it's uh, Jada Pinkett Smith, her red table talk got popular because it was good. It, of course, she was a celebrity. Right. But people share great content, you know, and there's nothing better than people talking. And, you know, that's all I can say is to knock on different doors and, and try to get some media behind you. I've always used television and won't let it use me. And maybe there's another subject dear to your heart that you can promote. But at the same time, when you're on television and they ask you what the, uh, the Chiron below will say, it'll be, you know, no hipsters allowed dot com. <laughs> you know, that's how you promote yourself. Hey, I right. went on Bill O'Reilly with raprehab.com. I said it, and within 13 seconds, my site crashed because got got 100,000 visitors. Oh, wow. But I didn't know. Right. You know, I didn't have the right stuff up. So I probably lost 2 million people that night. Wow. wow. So, you know, you just got to think of those chances, but. You know, the the good thing is there's a lot of subjects that that you can be the expert on if you can be an expert. Well, Mr. Porter, this has been uh, an absolute pleasure. I, listen, as like we said, we're going to have to have a, a part two. Uh, so thank you so much for, for stopping by. Before we leave, let the people know where they can find you on social media. Um, I've got an app. It's called Music Biz U. And you can find me on IG, Twitter, Clubhouse, at Music Biz U. And um, I answer back. Just don't send me a message that say tap in. Like, say something more. <laughs> <laughs> tap in, man. Okay. Tap in. Yo, tap in. Right. <laughs> or just don't send got me it. a link. You got know, it, got it. You can't spend a little time. You know, there's enough to sort through. Hey, but right. it's been a pleasure. Of Be course. Read the damn book, and when you finish it, call me. You'll, you'll have do. plenty to talk about. I, for sure, for sure, for sure. All right, thank you so much. Episode 32, No Hipsters Pod. Talk to you next time. Bye.